welcome to Minor Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And we are two industrial designers in the big city. Sweating the small stuff. Woo. We're actually recording on Halloween. We are. And we are dressed up. <laughs> what are you dressed up as, James? I'm dressed up as unemployed James. <laughs> I'm dressed up as normal Nick. <laughs> All right. It is a little kind of, it's kind of sad because I uh, see all my friends dressed up for their office parties. Oh, yeah. And, you know, when you're independent freelancer, you <sighs> you kind of just sit at home like, should I dress up by myself? Right. <laughs> you know, last year I had this idea that there should be a freelancer holiday party, like a, a Christmas party or whatever. And... Uh, you know, it didn't it didn't come to fruition. I didn't make it happen, but I think it's something worthwhile to try and organize in New York. We should do it next time. Oh, we need to do another meetup sometime. Yeah, for sure. We should get on that. Um, um but yeah, I you know, there's it's funny like when it comes to Halloween, I uh I like I love the season, but I never ever do anything for it. That's the thing. It's like I always wait to the last minute for Halloween. And every year I'm like, I just want to make a Daft Punk costume. Yeah. I just want to do the whole thing. We've all seen the YouTube video where the guy does the Daft Punk costume to the T. And right. puts the LEDs in it. And it's just, you know, I love Daft Punk. It's going to happen one day. I'm going to plan it out before I die. But <laughs> every Halloween, I it's always in the back of my mind, like, oh, I should do it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I I'm just mostly get impressed with whatever reed pulls off oh yeah reach lego has amazing halloween costume. did he do anything this year uh i think he's just gonna storm out in his uh viking costume okay i mean that thing took long <laughs> enough he should be able to wear that for the next i don't know 50 halloweens yeah well i got uh my shipment in of bottle openers which i was a little bit scared about because if you recall i sent a bunch of money over to china to buy a thousand of them yeah. Which is a lot of bottle openers. And and, I, <laughs> and they actually fulfilled the order. Yes. they. That's that's always nice. They sent them and they're stacked up in my studio. 14 boxes. Carried them all the way up. Four flights of stairs. <laughs> <laughs> that's what How you call How heavy it. are they? Uh, I don't think they're terribly heavy. I would say each box is like 20 pounds or something. Right. But, you know, it's a lot of boxes. Yeah. So I'm excited about that. I'm going to look into a little bit of wholesaling for almost objects so that's kind of my new and new endeavor to dip my toe in to see if i like it mm. that's sweet yeah I, I just also restocked on uh, a bunch of the wayne bottle openers in preparation for the holiday season and also uh this guy this, the new one the bottle opener number two is now complete and if you're Does watching it have a name i haven't named it yet uh, if you're watching the YouTube video, you just saw me slip with it. Uh, it does open bottles, <laughs> but uh, but yeah. So I'm I'm pretty excited. I'm excited about this guy. This is the the more bar blade style one. Yeah, and I'm tempted. I'm tempted to get one. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty happy with the way that it turned out, and um, you know, looking forward to putting it on the website and making it official. Yeah, it's a little a little pre-promotion segment there so if you own a bottle opener we're we're stocked we're back in it we're back in business <laughs> um oh i also another thing i was working on this week which is you know kind of continuing on from my last couple weeks of like just maybe designing my life more than actually designing products yeah i uh i purchased the opz the teenage Ooh, engineering opz yeah which is is the uh it's like a synth it's a musical instrument mom and it uh it makes electronic music and it's a synth and sequencer i believe yeah um but if you aren't familiar with teenage engineering they're an engineering slash design uh round full 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 process crazy amazing team that really creates beautiful designs the designs are very uh functionally driven but they also have this playfulness to them yeah um, there's a lot of buttons on it. <laughs> they have a lot of buttons on a lot of their products. The funny thing is their website would have you believe that they're a Japanese company, but they're, they're Swedish company. Yeah, they're Swedish. Mm -hmm. And I think even Fastco, I was reading an article and they said Japanese company, teenage engineering. And this was like maybe a year ago. Um, 
and I just I I cringed a little bit, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I, you know it's it's uh, it's cool because they do have this very engineering forward aesthetic, but it's like so the design is very I don't know I guess it's sort of like hidden in plain sight, um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's very functionally driven, but I don't know. There's something that's so enticing about it. Um, but yeah, I've been playing around with it. It's it's nice to have like a little something that I can take a. It's nice to actually pick up a new thing and not know anything about it. Right. Because every day, you know, I'm designing and I'm having fun and I know the process and I usually push myself. But it, you know, I wouldn't say I'm a beginner at it. I'm not a beginner designer. Right. So it's nice to be a beginner at something again and kind of learn. Yeah. And also, I'm not very musically talented. Oh no. <laughs> I can't keep a beat, but thankfully, computer can. You know? Ta ta ti ti ta. So that's why I can I can play this instrument because it's just a computer. T t t t ta ta. You this, remember those this, lessons? No, definitely not. I don't. Oh that. come on. Um, but uh, yeah, I know that. Like, there's a lot of designers, uh, like Aaron Draplin. Does he dabble Draplin in design? Music? He he's got like a little acoustic guitar. I mean, it's another creative outlet. I think it's I think it's also nice to just kind of noodle at something while you're maybe taking a break from your work or you just want to distract your mind for a moment to see like if i distract my mind right now what might i come up with it's a nice it's a nice relaxing thing too because it's yeah. less it's less thinking more feeling mm-hmm. design is a very thinking heavy it, it can it can be a very thinking heavy uh exercise right um, but yeah, I've been I've been kind of dabbling around with that, so I don't know. That's something I've been playing around with. We'll yeah. see. We'll see if I get any good at making music. I'll have to start a new like Instagram account or something. Yeah, late um, night Nick. That's that's your late night. Is that, Nick. Is that my DJ name? That's your DJ name. Oh, and then I also finished the familiarism article. That's on my website. You finished a draft of it. <laughs> James doesn't think it's finished. He's already critiquing <laughs> it. I published the second version. Yes, and uh, I do would I would love feedback if yeah. you all can visit nicholas-baker.com backslash familiarism and I'll link it into the description but nothing's uh, ever finished Nick that's true you know? it only, it's only gonna be finished when I die so <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah I, I kind of revamped it made it a little bit more robust and certainly there's things that I can still keep noodling on but give it a read let me know what you think send me a message about it I would really appreciate it yeah um we have some follow-ups on the last episode. Yeah, well, last episode we talked about modular and right. multifunctional design and the Discord. They loved it. They had some amazing suggestions, some amazing comments, and I just wanted to touch on a few of those because it was some good stuff. Um, I know that a couple of people were talking about one one of the best modular pieces of furniture, the Vitsu 606 shelving mm. system. Mm-hmm. Designed by Dieter Rams. Yeah. It is like the dream shelving system for every designer. Um, and it's it's quite pricey if you've ever tried to look it up. Uh, but, you know, it's it's simple. It's like a, a rack sh- shelving, sh- shelving system. Mm-hmm. Um, but I feel like just like this is this is where I feel like modular design kind of falls short for me is, again, this feels like it doesn't feel home to me. It feels office. It feels studio. Like I know that they're showing shots of it in like a home setting, but the, like the exposed hardware and everything being as sort of like clean and clinical as it is, it's still, I think that there's a, a piece of every, every piece of modular design, that I've really come in contact with, like everything feels very much like a part to a whole, or you can just sort of sense like, um, well, I think that's a little, I feel like it's a little bit of Dieter's aesthetic. Like it, he has that very utilitarian style. So I think maybe that's where it lends into it. But I think another thing to touch on, you know, I think last up last episode, we kind of talked about modularity Mm -hmm. and a lot of bad modular products. Right. Um, but there are a lot of great modular project products. And I think the whole modular furniture, modular shelving thing, isn't necessarily that 
it's something you are going to rearrange every day. Right. The reason that it, modularity is good in the furniture space is that it is something that fits a wide range of spaces. Because you never, you know, this right. the shelving system might go into a tiny little office and you might only have like two shelves. Right. Whereas if you have a huge room, you can, it's modular so you can expand upon it. Yeah. Um, and then it's also just great for shipping. Like if you had to create that huge bookshelf to fit in that huge room. Oh yeah. It would be terrible to ship. Absolutely. So I think that's where it, where modularity succeeds in the furniture space. And I know, I think Steelcase had designed some really nice modular stuff as well. That was another comment on the discord. Yeah. I think, I think there's just a lot when it comes to office, uh, outfitting offices where you have a lot of these modular systems. Cause right. that just makes sense. I mean, you just, you know, there's all these sort of repeatable desk cubicle or um, divider sort of situations right. that you have with offices. Um, I mean, I can't imagine filling an office with every single piece of it being a different piece of furniture. Yeah. And to just organize it in this way just makes sense for whoever's outfitting an office space. I also liked uh, Ryan's comment on the Discord. Ryan mentioned the Google project that mm. that we talked about last episode, which right. was the modular phone concept Aura. Yeah, and that was all about like switching out components, taking out the camera, replacing it with a new camera if your camera's bad. Yeah, maybe you need more more storage. You pop out the storage pack, put a new storage pack in. And what was interesting about Ryan's comment is he was talking about just the feasibility of this project. And we hadn't kind of mentioned it. Like there's a, there's a good reason that this modular phone didn't go forward. Yeah. But Ryan talked about how, um, from a electrical, I guess, circuitry standpoint, all these different components talk to each other at lightning fast speeds. Yeah. And they all have to sync up. And even the, uh, this is terrible. We should get a electrical engineer to talk talk more circuitry stuff. But uh, yeah. Um, but even the length of the traces on the circuit board have to be as like they have to match up in length because right. how fast a signal travels across a circuit is a is a time. Like it's it needs to be calculated somehow. Yeah. And so putting a connector in at each component so that you can swap out completely ruins the efficiency of the product right at least now that's that's what ryan said and he's like sure maybe if this was like 90, 1993 it wouldn't matter but yeah i don't know it was interesting yeah no i mean it seems like at some point this is going to be feasible but just right now and, and but i guess the question is like if it is feasible, is it desirable? I think that's the thing is, is there's going to be trade-offs, right? And like there's, it seems, I don't want to say it's impossible, but it seems like if you could hardwire and connect everything seamlessly and not make it modular, then it would work better. Yeah. Maybe in the future we could somehow jump that hurdle, but yeah. I don't know. It seems like right now the thing that people are most interested in is cameras. Like that's that is what people talk about the most when they talk about hardware. It's really the when only when it comes to the phone. It's kind of like the only design detail left, right? For sure. Which does make me wonder about the whole augmented reality revolution. Is like, what does that mean for cameras? Does that mean the cameras are on the like on the headset oh when when we start getting into or air does, glasses or does that mean that the camera once again becomes a separate product and you like clip it onto your shirt wasn't there's the there's little cameras that you clip oh, onto man. your shirt you remember those uh well no <laughs> well i mean they have like there's obviously body cameras for, yeah for police no i i i was we were on the subway the other day uh, Allison and I, and we both noticed, like we weren't talking about it, but we both noticed the body cameras and just how big they are. That's interesting. Well, and, I, I'm sure they store every, th I don't know. Oh don't, yeah. They have to store a lot of, yeah, yeah. a lot of stuff, but it seems like in looking at a cop 
and all of the things that they're carrying. It's like, how can you be <laughs> agile in the slightest? There's just so much, there's so much stuff going on. Yeah, for sure. And the body camera is just this big hunk of hardware in the middle of their chest. It seems like a, a product right for designing. But yeah. but I was talking about, they actually have consumer grade cameras and they don't call them body cameras, but I, I can't recall what they were called, but I'm sure there was like a Kickstarter for one or two where it was a camera, you clipped it onto your shirt and then it just took photos, I would say every five minutes or so throughout your day. And so it was capturing you know, quote unquote memories or whatever. Right. Oh, and you yeah. could go back and you could like, oh, instead of like taking your camera out to take a photo of your, you know, barbecue, you were kind of just passively right. capturing that moment. Right. Um, oh. I forget what it's called. We can look it up later. Yeah, it. I've. Oh, I remember that too. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's it's interesting. Um. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I like. I remember somebody who worked on that project. So I'm trying to like go down the rabbit hole to figure it out. Oh so if you want to like <laughs> take us on to the next segment. Well, it's a uh, design, design news. news. Oh, I also, I believe my new OPZ can hook up to our audio equipment so we could actually use it as some sort oh. of a, some sort of soundboard. So I got to play around with that, but you know, it's coming. It's coming. Yeah. Um, well, it seems obligatory, we got to do it because we talked about the last two earbuds. Um, yeah. It is time for Apple's new AirPod Pro discussion. It's surpri- the, the thing that surprises me the most about it is that it was just kind of like, hey, here are the Air- <laughs> AirPods. It is kind of funny because like Microsoft and Google and those were, I think, do we have those in the past two episodes? It was definitely recent. Like everyone kind of released their whole new wave of right. wireless earbuds. But they all had big announcements for their earbuds, and Apple was like, "Oh, hey, we, it's it's on the site. Check it out." Yeah. <laughs> um, so Apple released new in-ear AirPods. They're called the AirPods Pro, and I don't know. I they definitely look different. They're in-ear compared to the previous design, which was, um, I I guess not in-ear. I don't know what you call the previous design. But but the new ones had the little cushion, right? Yeah. The new ones kind of plug into well, your yeah. ear, had the little cushion, and I've never really been a fan of the in ear style. No, because it always feels like I'm like clogging my ears. Right. But apparently they've done some some special trick with noise canceling and having an air intake where it doesn't feel clogged. And I've heard a lot of good reviews on these hmm. AirPods. Yeah, but they look pretty similar. They just look like a shorter AirPod with the the squishy silicone right piece on it. Yeah, the internet was immediately memeing hard on these. Yeah, it looks like uh, the Pokemon Bell Sprout. Bell Sprout. It also looks like uh, Plants vs Zombies little oh, like shooter yeah. thing. Oh yeah, there we go. Um, totally. But you know that's the internet. Yeah. Um. I don't know. I think it's interesting. I. I uh, I definitely like the idea of noise canceling earbuds because I just am not a fan of over ear headphones. I I don't know. I think I just my ears get sweaty too fast or something. It's just very uncomfortable. Do you have any over ear headphones right now? I have some old Bose noise canceling mm. ones, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've been kind of looking into some new headphones because you know I got this. Uh opz thing oh yeah what are you looking into um well the thing is is that it it the opz needs a wired wired headphones right so i haven't really done a ton of research on the wired ones but i really like the uh, bno play right headphones which right. are the bang olsen ones um but i don't know i don't know if if there's really a big design conversation around the new airpods besides the fact that it's just apple releasing another product right like they, they're not really that unique in their industrial design i think their technology apparently the audio quality is amazing i mean it seems like it would be a big enough deal to have announced 
like that they were to just at least say like hey we've got these new they announced everything did they they didn't have a new maybe they just didn't have enough products to announce because usually they announce like the the new ipad and stuff around this time yeah i know it's it's a little weird maybe i also like maybe this is good this is a good thing because you know we're in this kind of cycle in this age of constantly putting out new products right Right. Everyone, everyone puts out a new product every single year and it's almost starting to be twice a year now yeah and maybe it's okay to slow down like maybe this is all right if it's not a big announcement maybe it's just an incremental thing mm-hmm. I'm, but it seems like a radical like not a, i mean it's not a radical departure but the fact that they have noise canceling earbuds seems like a decent enough deal to want to talk about right in a like uh and then yeah that like (laughs) and then the airpod the new case or the case for them is kind of funny well the the new case is essentially the old case except it's it's, they didn't hold shift when they they, yeah they it's it's elongated instead of so the cap is on the side instead of on the top um which makes sense i still appreciate the airpods case over the past google and microsoft cases i i still like the airpods better um Mm -hmm. i think my question is you have let's just say you get to choose one of the three microsoft google or the new airpods pro which one do you pick like if i if i had to say here's the money right now you have to purchase it right now right i i mean i think for the noise canceling feature i am interested in the airpod pros right i want to i kind of want to try the google ones this is the interesting thing, right? Because from an industrial design standpoint, the Google ones look better. Yeah. In my opinion. Yeah. But from a brand standpoint and from a quality standpoint, we are just so confident that the the Apple ones would be better, right? It, at least that's how – that's the feeling I get is like mm-hmm. I know I'm getting a quality product. And with the, the Google ones, it's like I'm sure it's quality, but it's still kind of like – who knows you know i don't know we gotta try it out yeah i think it's the problem for me is just the idea of having a google product interacting with all of my apple products yes the ecosystem. not that not that one not that the google product is going to infiltrate and destroy all of my apple products right. but that maybe it won't be so copacetic the way right. that they work together mm-hmm. so that's that's the big question for me but I would I would like to try them out. So, I don't know. Well, let us know what you guys think. I yeah. think it'd be that's kind of like a good survey question. Like, yeah. Which of the three would you get? Um Oh, speaking of surveys. Hey. hey. But 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 oh, well, we, we don't have a like, promotional segment uh little sound bite, do we? Uh we hey, do once, not. Once, once I get my soundboard up, oh, we're going to go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um so we have a little promotional segment here. Uh we had a lot of responses from the survey, and so we appreciate all the responses. But if you aren't familiar, we are doing a podcast survey. Mm-hmm. We do this. Well, we did this last year, and we're doing it again this year, where you guys can click on the link and do a Google survey to give us your feedback on the podcast. Yeah, it's super helpful. We like if you don't do anything to help the podcast except listen, you should do this one thing because it does really help us. You you guys have given us great feedback already. And, you know, we really enjoy your feedback. Um, and also, if you do it, you get a chance to win one of James or mine bottle openers. Yeah. So there's a little perk at the end, too, if you enter your email. So do the survey, and we are super thankful for it. Um, also, we wanted to just promote the Discord. Mm-hmm. If you aren't in, aren't in the Discord, there's some awesome designers on there always chatting. Yeah. It's a great place to connect with design the design community there. Um, and we got pins. We do have pins. If you guys want to support the podcast, you want to buy a pin, put it on your shirt, pin up your sketches with it, <laughs> <laughs> buy 10 of them. Um, and then always we, always we like to thank our promotional partner, Let's Design Daily on Instagram. They post great design of everyone, really, all kinds of designers. Um, and check them out. Good stuff. All right, James. We're doing our podcast on Halloween. Yeah. And it's going to get spooky. Ooh. What's our topic? 
Uh, well, should I turn down the lights? Yeah, turn down the lights. We want to tell some design horror stories. Horror stories. Horror stories. Uh, because it is Halloween. Ooh. When you're listening to this, it won't be Halloween. It'll be like Thanksgiving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. It won't be Thanksgiving. But everybody's got horror stories when it comes to design. And so we wanted to share ours. Yeah. I don't know who wants to go first. I it seems like it seems like you got some good I, ones. I've, I've written down like a whole list of horror stories. <laughs> um, I mean, my horror story personally is that I just failed to open a bottle with my new bottle opener, but it's okay. No, it's fine. You opened well, it eventually. Yeah. Well, this is it's a funny thing. So when I was working at Quirky, uh, the the CEO uh, Ben Kaufman. He would often demonstrate live because we would do these like live broadcasts on Quirky, and he would demonstrate products that we had we knew were perfectly functional. Yes, and in the moment, completely screw it up. And it's like I feel like when it is like that that moment of like Prime oh my god everybody's watching at like that's it's the moment when when the product fails. And like we had this particular thing which was called the pluck, and it was like for for taking egg yolks out of egg whites. I think I remember that. That was yeah. like a, a pretty popular product. Wasn't yeah. It? And so the first time Ben like showed it off, he like he like couldn't get the egg yolk up, <laughs> and we had tested it and like tried it many many times. It worked every single time except the one time you needed it to work. So that. That was that was a horror story that I witnessed, and uh, yeah, it's so it's so funny how that happens. It's it happens, but I think always in hindsight, it's kind of a fun thing. It's it's never like a bad thing. No, I feel like that's how my a lot of my stories are. Yeah, is it always is bad in the moment, but you look back on it and it's kind of like a fun memory for sure. <laughs> um, well, I think maybe one. I have a lot of close calls. Yeah. And, you know, design school, I think you have a lot of horror stories. Oh, we're putting the light on. <laughs> <laughs> when you look at the YouTube, you can see my face in the, in the horror story. Yeah. Um, this is how you tell scary stories. Don't you know anything? <laughs> well, I definitely had a few stories in, uh, in college where people got injured. Did you have any injury was it stories? A, was it a dark and stormy night? It was dark and stormy night. We were building our foam core models of robots. So at, at oh. SCAD, we had to construct huge robots out of foam core. Um, and every year, they changed the topic. I know like one year, they did boats. One year, they did like ATVs. Yeah. Our year, we did these mechanized robots. Yeah. And our robot was the underwater creature that could or underwater robot that could capture creatures that had never been cataloged before like species and oh. like had little canisters and it had a little vacuum that could capture what was this class this is model and prototyping wow so this is like all about building with foam core crazy yeah and uh we had my one friend blake he was it was i would say it was three three a.m in the bench room <sighs> which is our workshop and you know, we had we had a bunch of guys. We were all cutting foam core. You know, we had one guy printing out the plotter paper of like the patterns that we were supposed to like match and everything. We had the hot glue gun. It was it was always ready to go. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's getting pretty late. You know, we're starting to get a little crazy. You know, we we're about two five hour energy drinks in, and uh, Blake comes down with with the exacto knife and just <laughs> cuts his thumb and, oh. and I'm like oh no oh no and he's like oh I got to go outside I got to go outside I'm like okay <laughs> we're, we're, we're going outside and uh yeah the, there was there was some blood uh, maybe a lot of blood uh, and uh yeah we uh it was it was pretty scary we had to he poured super glue on it Oh no! Well, you know, super glue was actually invented. Oh yeah, to to close up wounds. Yeah, in the army. Yeah. Um. So yeah, we 
I think Blake put super glue on it and then continued to work. Oh, so that was a horror what story. What a trooper. Yeah. So shout out to Blake. Yeah. Man, that was a memorable moment. What about, the, I see something about a ben, the Ben mirror. Well, the Ben mirror is my last horror story. That's an actual horror story. <laughs> I, got, I got one more. One more. Um, there was a horror story where this was a close call. It was another model. The thing is, the horror stories are always with the models. Because the models, oh, yeah. there's so many times when you're building a model that something can go bad. Right. And the materials t- are kind of, it can be kind of unpredictable. Right. In a way. Or just like, yeah, I don't know. It's the one time that you're really engaging with dangerous objects. Yeah. The one close call I had was I was doing another model and prototyping project where I was building a lamp that was vacuum formed in two halves and we had to put it together and then paint it. And one of the requirements was you had to make it a perfect gloss finish because we were learning how to make something glossy, right? How do you paint something to be glossy? Yeah. And you had to do it like with this clear coat and you have to like sand it with you know you wet sand it's like 3000 grit you know all the you know like if you were doing a if you're redoing a hot rod or something right like a vintage car you want to make it perfect so i was doing my lamp and i was at the painting stage everything was going good i primed it i had sanded it for like 10 hours and i thankfully thank goodness my professor taught us the importance of doing a test piece. Oh. So I had painted everything my color of choice, which was white. I just went with straight white. Yeah. Coincidentally, I had bought glossy white. You know, I had fully expected to paint over it with the clear coat gloss, which was what we were taught. It was like, hey, choose your color, paint over it with clear coat. And I was like, okay, I'll choose my color white, and I just picked glossy, like not even thinking about it, right? I paint everything, it's perfectly white, and it's, you know, coincidentally glossy. And I was like, oh, you know, I'll put the clear coat on it. I'll make it even glossier so mm. I can, like, see my reflection in it, right? Right. And then the my professor popped in my head, Nick, Nick, do a Nick. test piece. Do a test piece. Nick. And so do a test piece. <laughs> he's, so uh, I did. I sprayed a test piece. And right as I sprayed the test piece with my glossy, the test piece just shriveled up. And, and it disintegrated because what they – what most people don't know is a lot of um, spray paints actually react with one, each- one oh. another. And that's why you always have to do a test piece. Oh. So I actually never put a clear coat on it. I just presented it with the, sh- you know, the Rust-Oleum gloss white paint on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay. You want, you ready for this last one? Yes. My last, uh, my last horror story is like the real thing. This is, this is the one that like, you know, I'm out of cash for so. All right, let me get let me get a little sip drink. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> this is why Nick is an alcoholic. <laughs> I was drinking Lacroix. <laughs> <laughs> um. So the Ben mirror, are you familiar oh. with the Ben mirror? The very first almost object. Yes, the Ben mirror. It was a flat piece of stainless steel, and it had cut uh, two lines, perforated lines, so that you could bend it. You could bend it to sit on your shelf. You could hang it and bend it so that you can see your shirt and your shoes at the same time. Um, you really need to set these up more like horror stories, Nick. I, I, well, I can't <laughs> encourage this enough. So, I, <laughs> I mean, this was my very first production product. This was the product that I was going to spend money on to get a, a, a an order made, a hundred oh, of them. Oh, yeah. Which, you know, it's a decent amount of money to get a hundred of them from China. That's why I worked on Alibaba. I found this supplier, and they sent me a sample. And I got the sample, and it was great. I loved it. Perfect. Everything was good. And, oh, actually, we should back up. Because I was actually submitting Go this. back, Nick. <laughs> Go back. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sure that you can do a better horror story than me, James. But <laughs> <laughs> um, I was actually submitting this mirror to the... American Design Club right uh, exhibition in New York City and this was when I was still in Texas and I was really and they were like what are you talking about the American Design Club has been dead for 20 oh years <laughs> no they're still alive and well. um, I did not reach the deadline in time 
and I was like, oh, hey, I missed the deadline. Can I quickly just send you my design? And they're like, oh, yeah, you know, send it by Friday or whatever. I think I had like three days and I had done nothing. <laughs> I mean, I had my idea. I knew I wanted to make this bending mirror, but I had right. done absolutely no research on how <laughs> to actually make the thing. And you do have to submit a physical product. Yeah. So I was like, okay, how am I going to do this? So I remember g- taking off my lunch break at Petmate and like driving, t- finding, going to like Home Depot, buying a sheet of steel, mm. like one millimeter thick, <laughs> taking it. And thankfully it's Texas. So like there's water jet manufacturers everywhere. Right. <laughs> and they got all kinds of crazy manufacturing capability. And I took it to like the local uh, manufac- water jet manufacturer and had him cut it. And what it- do you want, man? <laughs> That's how it was. That's how it was. <laughs> And I was like, please, please, You're sir. like in the middle of the night. Please, sir. Do, 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 do. Let me in. I need to use your water jet cutter. <laughs> um, thankfully, they cut it right away. And this is just a piece of raw steel. Right. This is not a mirror at all. Yeah. So then I had to go to Harbor Freight and buy one of those buffing wheels and buy <laughs> an entire <laughs> array of buffing, I guess, what do you call them? Sticks? I don't know. They, there's like sticks. There's... I even bought like car wax. I just bought everything because I was like, buffing I got, sticks. I gotta get this if, done. If I get some triple X <laughs> Google <laughs> Google search for these buffing sticks, and we gotta put a disclaimer on the YouTube now. Yeah. Um. And so I did. I took. I I like left work, and I took. I would say five six hours just with the Harbor Freight like buffing wheel just going uh, uh, on raw steel until you know i worked up the grades right until i got a finish where you could actually see a mirror wow and then the next day which was the last day to submit i went home on my lunch break just to take photos of it in in good sunlight and eventually i got it i got it made wow oh but that's not the horror story that was my tangent whoops i'm a bad storyteller sorry guys (laughs) um the horror story is, is who that, did you kill well i didn't kill anyone <laughs> the horror story is that i ordered so you know fast forward i get these things manufactured at my uh supplier in china mm-hmm. and you know the sample looked great i was like oh this is perfect you know there's no flaws there's it's perfect mirror finish i love it and so i order a hundred of them and you know i wait you know, a month to get them made because it takes time to make these things. Yeah. And then I actually got them ocean freighted, mm. which is, you know, they ship it on a boat from right. China to America because it think these things are heavy. Real designer I got a, ship. I got, a, I got a, yeah, maybe too literally, right? Um, I got a hundred of them and I get this email maybe a month in from some sort of, you know, tariff center that's like, sir you need to pay the tariffs and i'm like what what is what does that mean (laughs) and so i just i think i remember i had to pay money i had to pay i think i paid a thousand dollars so the ben mirrors cost ten dollars each to make and then i had to pay like fifteen hundred dollars just to ship them oh man and i realized i shipped an entire pallet so it was mostly empty air that i shipped but it was just the space that i shipped oh um Anyways, I get this message that's like, you know, pay the tariffs, so I pay it. I actually think, I, I can't remember how I paid it. I think I, it was definitely an ordeal. Like, I had to fill out all these paperwork documents, and I thought I was going to go to jail for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you, like, sign your own paperwork to get right submitted into jail? Yeah, exactly. And Omitted, or no, never mind. I, everything's finished, and they say, okay, no problem, we'll ship it to you. It'll all be good. And then I get another email. I would say, you know, a couple weeks later, your mirrors are here. Go pick them up. And I'm like, at my house? What do you mean they're here? Yeah. They're in San Antonio. <laughs> and I lived in Dallas. Oh, my God. So I did not realize that you they only shipped it to my closest port city. If I lived, if I lived in North Dakota, I would have had to drive from <laughs> North Dakota all the way <laughs> to San Antonio to pick it up. Oh, my God. Um so thankfully it's only it was like only four hours away oh actually it was houston apologies. only and so i i this is actually after i had stopped working at petmate so i actually did have time to like take an entire day drive to houston 
pick up the mirrors and come back. Right. Um, and then the horror of the story is that most of the mirrors were scratched up. And so I only, oh. I only, I only, I think I only have like 20 of them that are good. Did you like rebuff any of them? Did you try to correct them? The thing is, is like if a mirror is scratched in order to fix it, you got to go from the bottom zero, zero to all the yeah. way back up again, which oh would mean five God. hours for each mirror. So yeah, there's my horror story. That's a true design that's horror a, story. That is a, that's a lot. I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, it, so that's, I'm sure. that's why the mirror sold out is that I sold 10 of them and then I decided not to sell anymore because I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't confident in the quality. Entrepreneurship is uh see is like a horror story in itself yeah um it's a good learning process though for sure is it your time is it horror story for james time i think it's horror story for your, james time your light up to your face like a horror film it was a dark and stormy night <laughs> it's a lightning bolt yeah so my second year of college when it was second semester and the first project that we had when we came back was with this company. I can't recall the name of it, but they specifically did cell phone accessories. And this was like back in the day when smartphones were brand spanking new. This okay. was like a totally new market. Okay. And so they sponsored this project for us to do cell phone cases. And um, the thing that I ended up designing was like the thing that I'm so embarrassed by looking back on it it was like the whole idea was a cell phone case for the working guitarist my my brother-in-law did it have like a tuner on it or something it, it should have um but uh yeah my brother-in-law a working musician and so i decided to talk to him talk to all of his friends about you know, what would you guys want in a cell phone case? And for whatever reason, I chose a BlackBerry as the one to design for, I mean, as the cell phone I feel to like design at, for. at a certain point, BlackBerry was a, yeah, a hot phone. It was. Um, and not because it was getting overheated. I mean, I don't know. BlackBerry <laughs> no, seems pretty... Sam, Sam, they, Sam's the one that over. Oh, right, him. right. Um, and so... Oh, gosh. We have a ghost in the studio. Yeah, my... <laughs> <laughs> The coat, James's coat just moved on that's, the coat rack. That's very, that's very disconcerting. All right, it's, it'll be fine. <sighs> okay, we have summoned some spirits here, so <laughs> bear with us. Um, so yeah, I the the case that I ended up designing had like it had like faux frets, like a like a fret <laughs> on a guitar, and there was a guitar pick that fit into this one feature. Wow. Like it was just a really really tacky design. Um, which is a horror story in itself. But what happened was basically everybody in studio was working all through the night to get their presentations ready. We had to print out these like, you know, 48 by like four foot by six foot posters or whatever off of the plotter. And uh, so everybody's working on their posters, working on their presentations. And we had to present to the clients you yeah, know, these guys that had come down. This was a real company. This was a real yeah. company. I don't know if they're a real company anymore. Oh, well, they, they were they a, were after they sold the the fret guitar <laughs> case. It just went down. Over yeah, there. pretty much. They went bankrupt. Um, they told me to come to San Antonio to pick up all of the leftovers. Uh, but what? So everybody's in studio working until like the eleventh hour, right. of course. Yeah. And there were always. There were always the people in your studio. Did you ever encounter these people who like shouldn't have been as confident as they were, but they would walk out at like 10, 10 p.m. Right, and you were like, "They're not going to finish." Oh, come yeah. on! Yeah. But anyway, so I think I got out of there at like nine a.m. When was the when was the the me- presentation, presentation was at? I believe it was at one. Okay, and so I thought like. So I oh no I, okay so oh, I no. <laughs> I leave the studio after the dark and stormy night yeah and I'm walking home basically in a daze like you know what it's like to pull an all nighter and you're just like you know it is it is a very Dracula vampire moment of yes, like for sure the sun yeah you know mm-hmm. so I I walk outside and I'm walking back to my place it was walking distance from campus 
I get I get into my apartment and I say to myself, you know what? I could probably get a couple hours of sleep no. oh, before no, this. This is not good. And so I I set an alarm to wake me up. I think it was at like 11 or noon or something like that. Because I was like, yeah, like a couple hours sleep, I'll be great. Oh, no. And so I... I just, all I remember is getting into my bed and just shutting my eyes. No. Like that was, that was it. And I wake up and I'm just like, man, I feel great. <laughs> I feel so good. Like this is going to be a great day. And then I look at my phone, which was like, at the time, it, I didn't have a smartphone. I think it was just like a flip, like a clamshell, right. like a clamp phone. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I flip it open, and I have like, I think it was like 47 missed calls. <gasps> oh, my gosh. All from classmates. Like, and I look at the clock, and it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I had essentially gotten an entire night's sleep. Oh. And I, like... It's so funny to me what I did in that moment. Like I, I went into my closet and I like ripped some clothes out and I went and I actually brushed my teeth really quick. Cause I was like, I think I still like, I, they can't be finished, but right. I don't know. And so I get out of my apartment and I just start running. Yeah. And the thing was, is that like, I hadn't run in years. And so halfway to studio, I literally just had to, bend over like stop bend over and catch just breath. <laughs> catch my breath and so i just kept running i ran down into the studio space thinking that they had already finished up right got down in there they weren't there and i was like oh my god everything's over it's yeah. all over yeah, and yeah. so and so i run up to the presentation room and run in and somebody was still presenting and so I, I run in and I sit down behind my professors and I'm like, I am so, so sorry. I like, you know, I, I set an alarm, but I, I slept through it and I can't, I still can't believe this moment, but up until that point, I was a fairly diligent, dedicated student. Yeah, yeah. And my professor, Mitzi Vernon, turned to me and said, we're just glad you're okay. It's like, <laughs> what? I like, I, they probably I, thought you died or something. They did. They, they thought that the only way that I right. would not make a critique is if I got run over by a car. Right. It's like the diligent student doesn't show up. What happened? You know? And I, I have to say like a lot of, a did, lot wait, did of, did you miss a presentation? I got to present. You at did. The end. No way. Yeah. And I even like, that's not I, a horror story. That's I, a, well, I guess that's kind of, I story. even made a joke at the at, like at the beginning of my presentation to like lighten them and it like and it actually kind of like killed but i don't even remember what it is at this point but uh, it was something about like i should have put an alarm feature in my cell phone <laughs> case but um but yeah it was uh i felt so terrible but my professors like didn't didn't bat an eye at the whole situation i i don't i don't remember and and i had a lot of people in my studio that were like that were kind of pissed at me because the my professor Mitzi and I had a good relationship. Yeah. And so she was like standing up in the between everybody presenting and be like, can somebody get James like, w like call James, find him. <laughs> That's <laughs> like, funny. they were going to send out a search party eventually. But the funniest thing about that whole day was when I was walking home that morning from studio, I saw somebody running down my street, like clothed as if, you know, not not clothed as if they were going for a run, right. but like clothed as though they were also late yes. for something. And I was like, <laughs> what an idiot. <laughs> That's karma for you, man. Yeah, that is some brutal karma. But uh, yeah, anyway. That's a good story. That's my, that's my design horror story. Well, I want to hear y'all's horror stories. Yes. So hop on the Discord, let us know your horror stories. That I think would be great. It's, it's, we're, I think we're a, maybe a week too late, but it's okay. It's still good. It's still good content. Yes, absolutely. Um, um, 
All right, I gotta take a little breather for after there. That, uh, that was a crazy story, James. Yeah, we got some questions in though. Oh yeah, if you guys want to send questions, send it to minordetailspodcast at gmail dot com. And then also we have a voicemail, and don't worry, we won't answer. You can send a voicemail, and we like the voicemails because it's fun. It's fun to hear your voice. Right. That's one six four six four nine four forty eleven. Heck yeah. All right, what do we got? Questions. We got not that Patel at not that Patel, and uh, they ask: Does hyper consumerism fuel industrial design, or is industrial design egging hyper consumerism on? Can industrial design disrupt this movement? That's a deep question. That is a very deep question. There's a there's a deep question for your horror filled episode. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes. Ooh, hyper consumerism. <laughs> I actually had to look up hyper consumerism because it seems like almost a made up thing. Um, but yeah, hyper consumerism was it's it's the uh, consumptions of goods for the non functional purpose more mm. more around just pressure to consume in general. Right. Um, I don't know. Well, you know, I, when I read this question, I had obviously. I don't think either of us are really qualified to answer this, you know, huge dilemma. There's so many factors that go into this question, but right. You know, my first thought was I actually thought millennials consume less. Oh yeah. Um, than the past generations. I know that, you know, past generations were more around the idea of keeping up, keeping up with the Joneses, you know, yeah. getting that new car, getting that new oven. Yeah. It was. Um, and millennials are a bit more focused on experiences. Right. If anything, the only thing that I see millennials binging on, like binge spending, is uh, on plants. Yes. Putting putting plants in their house. That's true. We buy a lot more plants. Also, I don't know if I've told you my theory about this. What's this? This is my this is my spooky theory. I mean, you remember that that movie, The Happening, that was like a M Night Shyamalan movie about how the Earth was essentially like releasing this chemical that made people kill themselves. No, I never, I never saw yeah. that movie. Yeah. That that's one, a, that seems like a scary. So, movie. but I obviously that's not happening. It was a horror movie, but I have this theory that in fact, what the plants are doing is they have infected us to bring them into our homes. <laughs> and eventually they will take over the, like the man-made world by infiltrating inside man inside. inside job yeah Ooh, that's a good that's a good theory yeah right i like that theory. i'm taking it all the way to the un <laughs> um but uh here's the thing and like with any with anything with any phenomenon there is no single cause effect right like it is I, I feel like people often want these kind of clean answers like, yes, industrial design causes all these things, but it's like a confluence right. of a lot of different things that give us any sort of effect in the in the lives that we live. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, whenever I think about these type of questions and I, I always think back to the source, right? Mm-hmm. Like, what is the source? Like, why are companies, you know, producing products as the, those five whys right ask the five whys and what you get down to is well there's someone buying the products right i right. mean if if company is not going to produce products if it, no one's going to buy it yeah um i mean it might happen once or twice but if people still don't buy it they're going to go out of business yeah so then i guess the real question is you know what are you consuming and maybe that's your avenue of, right of you know solving this problem it's like hey hey instead of like getting new shoes every couple of weeks why don't you just wear the same pair for a year until they break and then once they break go to take them and <laughs> put some duct tape up, duct tape on them however if you buy more than one pair of shoes those shoes are going to last over a longer period of time right because you use them because you frequently. yeah you use them less frequently right uh, or, or, the, or the same thing with like a phone like how long can you really hold out with your you know iphone like, right can you can you wait four years i bet you can yeah i bet you could wait four years i think most people wait two years but i think most i think you could wait four years yeah i don't see here's here's my thinking 
my current thoughts on this idea. I don't know, are people driven to consume or are people driven to create? Like, I feel like there's, and and maybe it's like, uh, maybe it is like some people are driven to consume, some people are driven to create, but it's like the reason that man has evolved is because of our inclination to create. Right. right? So like, and, and maybe if you were to think of like eating meat or whatever, like as that like basic level of consumption. Right. But we have this drive, this inherent drive to create. Yeah. I feel like that's what separates us from any other species on the planet. Right. And so to me, it's like, I just feel like, we because there are creatives we've empowered so many creatives we have essentially opened up a market where creatives can express themselves in ways that make for unique and desirable objects that people then consume right and i i just think that people like the way to achieve satisfaction oftentimes like you can you can do little tests of this just in your own life, but it's like if you make something, if you can literally see the fruits of your labor, it's one of the more satisfying experiences of being a human. Oh, for sure. You know. Yeah. And so, I like, is the is the inclination to create, like, is it more prevalent or stronger than the need to consume? And that are we just seeing consumption because we are these creative people creating? I I don't know. You're asking a lot of good questions, James. This is, this is, yeah, it's a tricky question. I mean, this one almost is like a a topic question. Yeah. You know, we, we've kind of danced around the the sustainability and these consumers and topics a lot. And obviously James and I talk about it off the pod and it's something we want to get to one day. It's just, you know, it's, it's a hard question to answer. And I think we just need you know, some expert to help us with that. We'll, yeah. we'll get there though. Don't, don't you worry. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's a great question. Not that Patel. I, I would say at least my gut feeling is like, can industrial design disrupt this movement? I don't know about disrupting it, but I think you can definitely make your small changes every day that can help. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, another question. Yes. Thank you for that question. And on to the next one. Nick, you want to read this one out? This is Yannick, and they say, I'm a young engineer from Switzerland wanting to switch to design. I currently work, I'm currently working on my portfolio for my application at an art university in Zurich. My question is, is what are your tips on portfolios for school applications instead of work applications? Um, what skills do schools want to see and do they want to see designed products? Right. Um, I thought this was an interesting question just because we've never really touched on it before. Yeah. And I'm, I mean, this is certainly something that happens when you're in high school, you're submitting to colleges, but also if you want to transfer or, you know, like Yannick, maybe they already have a degree and they want to get a different degree. Right. Um, a lot of schools do require a portfolio submission did your school have a portfolio submission it did not you just you did gpa and everything uh yeah i was just applying i mean i i did end up because i had a situation where i transferred into the industrial design program and so i like had an interview oh, with that's the head of the program okay. and so i did show like i didn't have to but i showed some work was it that i had done like some design ish work was it like art or what did you design or what I, did you make i you remember i showed i was like the head of promotions at the radio station okay uh on campus and so i made a lot of posters ah, okay um so yeah i ended up showing him some of that work i do i will say it really much depends on the school you're submitting to right. i know some schools have pretty strict parameters and then some schools like you know james your virginia tech maybe didn't have as many parameters on what your portfolio it has in it i yeah. i submitted 
purely an art portfolio. Right. Like I had paintings and sculptures in it from my high school. I never got into industrial design until college. Right. Um, and that was like that, that got me into SCAD. I didn't get me into, I actually applied to North Carolina State University. Oh. And that was my first choice just because it was close and it was in my state. Um, I actually did have to do an interview for that place. Like kind of like yours. even after the interview, they even, declined. Even after the interview, I got declined. Mm-hmm. Oof. So I, I, I think I vaguely remember that I wasn't really sure what I wanted. Right. Um, like going into the interview, I was like, I just, you know, I'm really, you know, I like the creative aspect. Like maybe this thing, maybe that thing. Maybe mm. I think I even wanted to do like iPhone apps at the time. This was during the, the app store boom. Yeah. Um, and so I think maybe like wavering on that wasn't that great and they're like well this kid doesn't really know like he doesn't oh, he doesn't yeah. want it you know yeah. he, there was there was a lot of kids that wanted to do industrial design yeah and i was like oh yeah i think it'd be cool but i didn't like have that like passion for it right so i don't know if that's any helpful tidbits i will say one thing that popped in my mind that you could do yannick and i don't know what engineering work you've done or what kind of creative aspects you've done but what if you took some of the engineering work you've done and just photographed it right in a, in a really beautiful way yeah that made it more artistic yeah yeah you know actually one of my one of my friends who is an industrial designer at MakerBot Vishnu he went to Penn State for mechanical engineering mm-hmm. but he then applied and got into the Carnegie Mellon product design uh, graduate program which was industrial designers and and mechanical engineers kind of combined and I remember him working on his portfolio and he had like shots from CAD and like oh. shots of things that he had done. Okay. And then he asked our friend Matt, who had gone to school for graphic design to help him put it together. And so that could be another thing. It's like, if you have any friends that are graphic designers or whatever, photographers, for sure. photographers mm-hmm. like, yeah, use, use the people that like, are, are good at these things to help you to put together that portfolio. Mm-hmm. Um, that could be really helpful. Um, and then shout out of the week, shout out of the week. Thank you, Yannick. Um, Nick, you found this. Yes. So this Instagram is at the underscore misused. And this is a, I, I'm not sure if it's a project or a studio, but it's to, uh, Taiwanese designers, I believe, mm-hmm. and they are taking hardware like home, like from Home Depot or or wherever, like just basic like you know stuff you would find at the hardware store, and creating objects from them. Yeah, it's so like the one object that we're looking at right now is a kind of a tray or a catch-all with a spiral-bound base to it. So it's it's two leather pieces, and then it's spiral-bound to create a tray. Which is fun because it's it's this repurposing of this hardware object for something that's you know n- not supposed to be repurposed for. Yeah, and a lot of these things are really really cool. Like they have this shelving unit that has is made out of two vent like ventilation panels. Yeah. So they just use the ventilation panels as like a way to adjust the shelving. Yeah. Um, check it out. It's it's really cool. It definitely is like up the 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 familiarism almost object alley that I really enjoy. So for sure. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty nice work and I would say that they do they do a pretty decent job of like hiding the the repurposed thing within. Right. It it's integrated the, really well. The objects. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, I I'm enjoying looking at this stuff. It's very it's very clever, but it's also very much um what's the word? It's like uplifting. What what's the what's the word I'm looking for? Fun. No, no, not not fun. <laughs> I'm not a dictionary, James. I <laughs> Come on, Nick. It's uh, elevating. Elevated. Elevating yes, the, it, it elevates, the object. It elevates the hardware a lot. Yeah. Um, check it out. At the underscore misused on Instagram. For sure. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for listening, guys. Of course, you can always check out the Discord and chat there. Um, you can find us on YouTube. Give, it, give us a like button on YouTube. Mm-hmm. And Spotify, follow on Spotify, rate rate on Apple Podcast. We have Google Podcast. Um, our intro and outro is by the amazing Kiyoshi the Kid. 
And yeah, as always, I'm at Nick P. Baker. And I'm at I Draw Receipts. Peace out. Later.